Hi, and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen, and I am so happy to have you join us today. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change the world. And this Explore Classroom YouTube show connects students from all over the world with our National Geographic Explorers for a short lesson and time for your questions. Today, our explorer is Andre Geitsch. Andre is a research scientist, author, underwater photographer, and ROV pilot from Bosnia and Herzegovina. He is dedicated to understanding the effects of pollution on sea animals like sharks, skates, and rays. Andre is also the head of National Geographic's Shark Tales team, a dedicated research diver and the general director of Shark Lab Adria, the Center for Marine and Freshwater Biology. Today, he wants to share why he cares so much about sharks and how you can join his mission in keeping them safe from harm. Before we get into today's lesson, let's welcome all of our friends joining in from all over. Wherever your class may be, give us a cheer when you hear your state, country, school, or class. So welcome to our friends from across the US and around the world. We've got students representing Texas, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Oregon, Ontario, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, Minnesota, Kentucky, Kansas, Illinois, Florida, Delaware, Colorado, California, Argentina. And we'd like to give some shout outs to St. Thomas Aquinas, Lighthouse, Lighthouse Institute, Anglo, Haldane Central, M.K. Lewis, Mott Elementary, Jefferson, Jonestown Elementary, Minesine Central PS, E.W. Foster, Kennedy King in New York, Regency Acres, Bishop Francis Allen, and Westgate Public School. We are so thrilled to have you all here with us today, as well as all of our friends watching on YouTube. And with that, let's get Explorer Classroom started. We are so excited to have Andre back and to share all about sharks. Take it away, Andre. Hello, everybody. I'm super delighted to be here with you today. And first of all, I hope you and your families are well and safe in these quite hard times. I just returned from my field expedition in Croatia. And before I started my presentations, there's something I bring all over just for you to see. This is a shark that lives on 500 meters deep, going live for each of you. It's something that we are studying at this moment. So I wanted you to see it directly from my hands. And now I think we are quite ready for my presentation. Uh, I had some issues with my connection before the morning, so I'm going to turn off my camera while, while presenting, but I will turn it back on when I finish. Well, I guess you guys like dinosaurs, right? Well, sharks have been around for a very, very long time, even before the dinosaurs, which was over 350 million years ago. Today, we believe that there's over 1,100 species of skates and rays. And right now, I'm gonna teach you a very cool world that you're gonna like. It's the Elasma branch. It's a, it, it's a scientific term that we, use, that we use in the science to describe different species belonging to one group that are sisters with sharks, skates, and rays. And what is the most interesting with these fishes is that the sharks, as well as, as, well as their relatives, the skates and rays, actually doesn't have a single bone inside their bodies and have no ribs. That's interesting, right? Yeah, instead they have a skeleton made up of cartilage, which is actually the material that shape your ears. Now you might want to touch your ears, right? When you touch your ears, that's what the skeleton of the shark is made of. Isn't that amazing? And they vary, they can be found everywhere actually. Most of the sharks live in the oceans, right? in the mild or warm parts of the earth. But some species are also adapted for fresh water and they can be found from the very surface of the ocean up to almost 4,000 meters deep, right? 
the species that you have seen on the beginning is also one of the deep water, the mesopelagic sharks that are present in our oceans. And when, when we look at the sizes of a sharks, they, they significantly vary. For example, the whale sharks are the biggest fish in the ocean, as you can see on the right slide, and they can weight over 90,000 pounds and attain over 50 feet in length. On the other hand, the smallest sharks, such as the dwarf water shark maybe, weight uh, is total length is 8.3 inches, which is like maybe when you put your palms together, that's the maximum length it can attain. And they are long living creatures. While most of the species feed on many different uh, uh, fish, invertebrates, mammals, even birds, the biggest sharks actually feed on plankton. And you might wonder what the plankton is. So let's look under the microscopes. All those tiny creatures that can be found in a single drop of the water present larvae of different fish, larvae of invertebrates, uh, other microscopic uh, animals that live in the sea water are actually main food source for the world's biggest sharks, like the whale sharks, like basking sharks, like megamoth sharks, which are su suction fielder animals. But what about their teeth? Uh, the sharks have a lot of teeth and their skin is covering their teeth, same as the human teeth, but only without the root. And it's very exciting because sharks can actually lose over 30,000 teeth in their lifetime. Is that something amazing, right? So there are many different teeth of the sharks and they are actually, uh, their shape is caused by the prey that they are consuming. So you don't like using your teeth, right? I bet you don't, but shark does. So each time a shark teeth is grown up or lost, the ne next one will replace it. So an average sharks has 300 up to 450 teeth in their jaws. But some species like the whale sharks, which we mentioned already, have over 4,000 teeth in their jaws. And there are so many different teeth, but if you look at the, the, big, the biggest one, the biggest teeth ever is actually of a megalodon. It was a de it was the biggest shark ever. And look at this massive tooth right here. They eat whales and different dolphins that, that lived over five million years ago when they, were, when they got extinct. And let me please just get back on this slide because shark as a long living creatures live from 25 to, five, to 50 years in average. But you might think that 100 years is a lot. Actually, it's not. If you look at the Greenland sharks, it may live over 400 years and they got mature at the age of 150. So these magnificent animals have been ruling our oceans for a very, very long time. And nowadays they need our protection from the certain extinction that could happen to man many different species as you will see in a couple of minutes. So imagine sharks with teeth like yours. They aren't so scary now, right? They look super funny. So this is the image I want you guys to have in your mind when somebody mentions shark, why? Because over 80% of the species is completely harmless to humans. And of all described sharks, only 26 are considered as life threatening. So have, have it in mind when you think of shark instead of just getting nervous and afraid of it. And they are extremely fast in the water. Most of the sharks swim 15 to 40 miles per hour, but the micro sharks can attain over 45 miles per hour, which is one of the world's fastest fish. So imagine a shark that is fast as an average car maybe. It's super interesting, right? So when, it, when we come to their behavior, I would like to share with you the photo of mine when working with zebra sharks. They're not all scary, biting at different prey, rolling the oceans. They are actually very play, play, playful. And it is estimated that people kill over 150 million sharks per year, which is actually all, almost 5,000 sharks per single day and making them some of the most threatened animals today. And over 65% over in the Mediterranean Sea where I mostly work is in a risk, risk of extinction in next 50 years. 
So it, it's the right time to make different and positive changes. Sharks, as well as their relatives, skates and rays, as you can see on my next slide, have perfectly good senses. One reason the sharks, including the great vice and skates and rays like this leopard we pray on my photo are extremely good hunters is because they have excellent senses, including smell, which, which is actually one of the third of the entire brain mass. Hearing, I bet you guys didn't know the sharks can hear, well, actually they can. And also the sight, besides all these basic senses, they could, they have also electroreceptive senses, which could help them to detect different elect electrical power in the water. In such way, they can also feel almost the Earth's gravity because that's how they navigate through the water. And working with sharks taught me one thing, that we have to understand all different animals in order to save them, because we are all connected in a beautiful way of this planet. And when working with sharks, cause us both to work in the field and the lab. When I'm in the field, like I was last week, I carry a lot of equipment that I wanted to share with you guys, because tomorrow in your future, if some of you became a shark scientist, this is what you will have to carry each time you go at the field. It seems massive, right? Yeah, it's over, it's sometimes, it's, always, it's almost 2,000 to 200 pounds weight on me. But when I go inside the water, I have something like zero gravity, so I don't feel this on my back. Working with sharks, it's not only diving with sharks, it's also the analysis of the fisheries, where I study how different pollution affects sharks and their lives and their, their populations. It helped me to understand how to develop different measures that could save them from the extinction and that could also save the marine ecosystems. Because if you lose certain species of sharks that are ruling the ecosystem, then we might then we might have unrecognizable ecosystems in the future, which is something we definitely don't want to have. So I believe that it is our fault, guys, and the protecting of our planets doesn't start with me. It actually starts with you guys. So I would like you all to make sure to use recyclable bags, to pack your lunch into re reusable containers, to do waste sorting, to carry reusable water bottles, to share all this tip with your peers. And there are many different ways how you can actually help, no matter that you live near the coast or away from the coast, because every single drop of pollution most likely will end up once in the oceans. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for a Q&A session and I'm looking so forward to answer all the questions that you might have for me. Oh, thank you so much, Andre. I I keep thinking about those sharks with the human teeth. And I think that was really incredible for you to teach us that most of the shark species don't want to harm us. They're, they're interested in fish and other things out there. So thank you for an incredible lesson. Friends, it is time for your questions. I know we've had a lot of questions already come in the YouTube chat bar, keep them coming. You only need to type them once, we archive them. Also, our on-screen guests, <clears throat> clear your throat and get ready for when you hear me call your name. We're gonna start with a kindergarten class who is watching on YouTube. Mrs. Pinder's kindergarten class wants to know, was the shark you showed us in the very beginning a real shark or a toy you have? No, it's actually a real shark, 100%. And I brought it for my field studies, especially to show you guys. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We're gonna to go to one of our on-screen guests. We have Mrs. Morgan's third grade classroom coming in from Pennsylvania. Mrs. Morgan, who's going to be asking a question this morning? Uh, Piper Schrock. Go ahead, Piper, ask your question. Um, what's the biggest shark you've ever seen? Thank you, Piper, for the question. Well, actually, uh, I was working a lot of with, with, a set, with ragged-tooth sand tiger sharks. Uh, they attain very massive sizes and they weigh almost 200 kilos and they go very big, uh, like a car. And when I, when, you, when I was the first time when I saw them, I was so scared that I was stuck with my camera like this and waiting for them to pass all over me. 
But after years, when I got used to working with over 50 different species of sharks, I even used to put them, put my hand on their um, fins to carry me under the water. So it's quite amazing how people can get into interaction with all these animals, not only sharks, but all other species that we are initially afraid of. We have a YouTuber who is curious if you have ever worked with baby sharks. Yes, of course. Uh, at, at this present moment, I'm leading a studies on the prenatal sharks, on the oviparous sharks that have placenta, same as the mammals have. And we are trying to investigate the effects of pollution on the baby sharks. And are there any possibilities for them to get sick even before they get birth, which is very important for us when we are working on the different ways how to save them and how to revitalize all these populations. So yes, uh, the baby sharks are called pups and they are extremely cute. And I've been working for many years and even we had our center in Malta where we have released pups from the sharks because at, at the fish markets, we collect the eggs of the oviparous cat sharks and we have actually released them in the water after they hatch in our labs. That's amazing. And it's so adorable to hear them called pups. <laughs> Yeah, they are pups. <laughs> well, we're going to go to another one of our on-screen guests. I'd like to welcome Sophia. Sophia, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Well, um, before I ask, um, I'm going to give you a short. Please ask your question. I don't want to ask it anymore. Can you ask your question. Um. Yeah, but also I just want to say I'm gonna tell you more about this after, but don't ever ever use the word fiber around me. I do not have a great history with that word. Sophia was wondering, how can you make sure that the sharks won't attack you? Oh, great question. When, when diving with sharks, especially in the wild habitats, we actually try to observe their behavior. And by, their, by understanding of their body language, we are actually unable to understand what they are about to tell us. And we are able to determine how close they want us to be. And that's how we actually, uh, when we are working with potentially dangerous species, and we are, um, in the most of the cases, actually, we are trying to do our best for sharks not to be afraid of us. Because no matter how big the animal is, it's, it's in most cases, the, the animal is far more frightened than we are. So we, we have this something that we have developed for many years. It's called zero stress approach that we believe how to approach animal in the wild, wilderness when, when it's absolutely necessary to step into close interactions, which is something that we uh, try to avoid as much as, as possible. But when we do, we do the zero stress approach, which means that no stress have first for animal and then for us. That's a wonderful approach. Well, we have another question from an, a YouTube viewer named Kinsey. And Kinsey wants to know, is the leopard shark going extinct? And why would some sharks go extinct? Yeah, it's an amazing question. Thank you. Actually, different pressures like overfishing, like uncontrolled fisheries, like pollution, microplastic, war waste, heavy metals, pesticides, etc., are causing dramatic declines in populations because most of the, not only sharks, but all animals are not developed their adaptations to survive such dramatic changes, even the acidification of the oceans. And all these happen in, in a very short periods of time. So animals that haven't changed for millions of years actually don't have time to adapt all these new changes. And when it's combined with overfishing, and it's, if you remember for the ground shark, right? It took almost 150 years for them to get mature. And most of the sharks got mature at age five, four, six, or even 10. And with these massive amounts of the landed shark per year, they stand no chances to, to actually uh, re, uh, to, to reproduce and to get healthy populations. And that is why most of them are actually in the risk of extinction. So we have something the IUCN have developed uh, different approaches how to actually 
study the risk possibility for different species and they have many different categories how to understand it and by by these rules we actually try to uh, see which species are the priority for conservation and for actually revitalization in their habitats but it is uh, utmost important for all of the species not only for critically endangered for the endangered but for all species because we, we have influence on every single living being on the earth we have another question coming in from mrs welch's class and they would like to know where in the world have you gone to study sharks uh, thank you for the question. I've been working on four continents in almost 100 states, uh, working in leading different studies, but most of my work is conducted in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. We have another question from a YouTube viewer class. Mrs. Shepard's class is asking about their teeth, and they want to know, are shark teeth hard if they have soft cartilage skeletons? That's a good question. I'm sorry I haven't described it, but the shark teeth and the skin are made of the bone. But the endoskeleton inside the shark is the cartilage. So teeth are actually quite similar to human teeth. When you cut them, they have same, they have also blood vessels and nerve, the pulpa, same as we do. But the root system is completely different than sharks. So yes, the teeth are quite hard. And they can be sharp, triangular, needle-like, serrated, non-serrated, even flattened with the species that consume uh, different sorts of mollusks, for example. And when you touch them, you feel like you are touching a stone. Did you say their skin is made out of bone also? Yeah, the skin is covered with the placoid scales. And the placoid scales are, all, are sim almost the same as the tooth. So yes, the, the skin is covered with a numerous of tooth on the most of the species, while some species have naked skin. And with the species covered with the tooth, if you try to scratch shark from the head up to tail, you will go very easily. But if you try to do it in the opposite way, you will feel the teeth on your skin. That's helps shark to have its body shape and also to have hydrodynamic while swimming so fast in the ocean. Wow, now that's an incredible adaptation. We have a question from a YouTube viewer named Jack, and Jack is curious if pollution even affects deep sea sharks. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. It's, it, there have been many assessments on the deep sea habitats and the effects of pollution, which was quite uh, smaller, but the, the recent studies, especially after the pandemic, have pointed out that there are uh, different pressures that are going bigger and bigger every day in deep water habitats. So uh, we are afraid that if these trends are continued that we might lose even the late, lightest pristine areas in our oceans. So yes, all habitats are being actually affected, even with the plastics. Wow. We're going to go back to one of our on-screen guests. Ms. Morgan's third grade classroom has a second student question. Um, Mrs. Morgan, who will take the second turn? This is going to be a hard choice. I have so many hands up. Um, I'm going to go with Zach Dillon. How much sharks have you worked with? Yeah, th thank you for the question. I've been working with around 50 different species of sharks, but most of my work is dedicated to the ragged tooth sand tiger sharks, for cat sharks, smooth hounds blue sharks and the mega sharks. We have a question coming from YouTube from Ms. Carr. What is the largest living shark that we know about? It's the whale shark. If you remember from the beginning of my presentation, it's attained over 50 feet in total length and can weigh over 90,000 pounds. And the whale shark as the world's living fish and the fish animal is also feeding with the plankton and, and, and microscopic organisms in the water. We have another YouTuber named Talia, and they would like to know how do sharks communicate or even do they communicate? Yeah, actually, there are uh, quite uh, amazing studies about shark social behavior. And although the mass, mass, most majority of the scientists, especially in the end of last century believed that sharks are mostly solitary animals, that's not true. They have 
so they have behaviors in the group and they have different ways of communications so when, when they are forming schools for example especially large predators like the hammerhead sharks that are quite large ruling the ocean they don't need naturally to form schools to stay protected because they don't they don't have anything to be protected from but they still form it and in many different ways uh, similar to other marine animals, they are trying to actually uh, form groups to swim together, to hunt together, even to share prey together, which is something that has been studied so far. So it, it is quite, quite hard to study. And uh, not only in sharks, but many, um, let's say, wild animals that are hard to follow, hard to track, hard to actually tag, etc. But yeah, there are ways and they are being studied how different species of shark actually might have social behaviors. Although most of the species are actually solitary. And I just saw that Jefferson had the same question as Talia. So great question, friends. So apparently the chat bar is filled with the same question. Which shark is considered the most dangerous and which one could be considered as gentle as a pet? Well, if you ask me, the most dangerous species would definitely be the bull sharks, the white sharks, oceanic white tip sharks, and maybe tiger sharks because of the level of testosterone they have in their bodies. On the other hand, uh, pet sharks, I would say it could be a zebra shark. I spend so much time playing with them and also different species uh, of smooth hounds when they are get used to the divers. But on the first sight, they are so afraid of the divers that they, if they feel you like 200 meters from you, they will actually swim away. And they are so gentle that if they get caught on the hook, they might have a heart attack and die. Oh, little shark angels, they sound so sweet. <laughs> well, Keystone Elementary has written in a question and they want to know if sharks can hear. Yeah, yeah, sharks have actually a good sense of hearing and uh, it's, it's connected with the inner ear system together with the balance. And uh, it, it is form of different uh, cartilaginous vessels inside the brain. And it, it, there's a fun fact with the sharks that I've shown you at the beginning. So I'm gonna tell you right now, the rock sharks that you have seen, I will show it again right now, have two tiny pores right here on the head. And when they got burned, they bury their head in the sand and they pick just a couple of stones from, from the sand and put them inside their head to use them as autolytes for the balance. So that's how they navigate through the waters. They're so clever. Well, we've got a question coming in from Ms. Manning. How are sharks born? Do they start as an egg? I know you described an egg sac earlier. Um, how is that happening? Yeah, that, that, that's actually a very good question. Well, some, some sharks gave birth to babies and most of the sharks actually give birth to babies, no matter if they have placenta connection, which is called viviparity, or the eggs are being developed inside mother, but once hatched, they go out alive also. And in both ways, they carry babies. A small percent of sharks actually have the eggs, which are called the egg cases or the memory purses, but all skates lay eggs. It's called oviparity. And on the other hand, race, give birth to live young as, as well. So there are three different types of reproduction in sharks, skates and rays, or if you remember the cool world we learned together today, the elasmo branches. We've got another YouTube question coming in from Breeze. When you are diving with sharks, how close do you normally get to them? Well, actually we try to stay as far as possible. And it's not because of our safety, it is because we don't want to interrupt and disturb the wildlife. But sometimes when we are working on the disease development, we actually have to go very close. And even with the skates and rays, sometimes I touch them underwater, so I'll palpate different lesions if I see something suspicious in order to avoid to have, uh, to have to take biopsy sample. But when we are working the labs, we are always working with the bycatch samples. We never kill and we never harm animals for the purposes of our studies. Mrs. Shepard's class has a great question. How do you know if a shark is safe to be around or not? It's, it's because of the position of their pectoral fins, their head, and the way that they are swim around us. 
Well, friends, we are coming to the end of our show. And I know you've got a lot more questions about sharks. Don't worry. We're going to share how you can get in touch with Andre through Twitter using the hashtag explore classroom. But for our last question, Andre, how can we take on your mission and help protect sharks? Yes, as I said on the end of my presentation, I believe that the protection of the sharks, oceans, and every other living creature actually starts not only with me, but with all of you. And by reducing the single-use plastic, by taking care of our waste, by taking care of uh, our peers and educating them of the importance of the conservation, especially the long-term conservation, we are doing far more than, than we believe. Because what we believe that the next generation of the planetary stewards that are you guys, are the people who will be responsible for sharks to continue to swim through our oceans and to maintain healthy marine ecosystems as we have today. Well, Andre, I just love that you are encouraging the future stewards of our planet and everyone watching, I hope that you will consider yourself a friend to the shark and that you'll think about these ways that you can help support not just healthy shark populations, but practices that are really good for everyone in the ocean and out. Well, if you are interested, and I bet you are, in more opportunities with us at National Geographic Education, please check out more of our Explorer classrooms. We've got more coming down the schedule and just a ton of resources at natgeoed.org. So I hope to see you at many of our next events including of uh, next week, we'll be right back here, same time, with Agustina Basada to learn about how we can live a more sustainable life without plastics. So if you are going to take Andre seriously and think about how you can protect the sharks, make sure to come back next week and you'll learn some strategies of how, maybe some extra ones than what he shared. You can register your family, your class, yourself, at natgeoed.org backslash explore classroom. Also, I'd like to say happy Autism Acceptance Month to everyone out there. And for those of you celebrating Ramadan Mubarak, have a great day, everyone. Stay curious, keep exploring. And if you're on screen, please turn on your microphone and tell Andre, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.